Thank you, Monkey Man, for suggesting this topic. So, uh, I didn't notice this till I sat down to read the script, and all it says for the intro is just, quote, think of intro later. And now it's later, so... Marshall Applewhite. He was a manipulative cult leader who convinced 39 people to kill themselves by eating poisoned applesauce. But why did he do this, and what did they believe in, and how was he able to convince people to do this? Well, Marshall was born in 1931 in Texas. His dad was a preacher who would move the family around a lot, and Marshall and his mother would always be very involved in the musical aspects of their services. And Marshall really wanted to follow in his father's footsteps, so he went to Austin College to learn to become a minister. After this, he went to another school and got married, but quickly dropped out to pursue a career in music. He managed to become a music director at a church in North Carolina, but this only lasted a few years as he was drafted into the army in 1954. He served in the army for two years, but after that, he decided to go back to school and really double down on making a career in music. He went to the University of Colorado, and here he would graduate with a master's degree in music with a special focus on musical theater. And things didn't go his way. At first, he moved to New York to try to become a famous singer, and that, who guessed, was very unsuccessful. He then moved to Alabama to try to teach music at the University of Alabama. He was then fired, though, because he got caught trying to bone one of the male students. This caused a big butterfly effect where his wife and kids would leave him, any church in the local area or any church that he had previously worked with wanted nothing to do with him, and his father disowned him. This put Marshall into a big depression. So, he decided to move to Houston to try to start over again, as not many people around there knew him. And he started teaching music at the University of St. Thomas. He also started to become a locally popular singer and joined the Houston Grand Opera. But he would unfortunately have to leave town and quit his job at St. Thomas after another alleged affair with a male student. He would travel around for a little bit, but after some time in 1972, he had some heart issues and he went to the hospital where he met a woman named Bonnie Nettles. She was a nurse and the two became quick friends. As she she would tell him that their meeting had been foretold by the extraterrestrials and that he had a divine purpose. No, I'm not making this up. So this is where his story starts to get really strange and he starts getting into all the cult stuff and it all starts because this nurse, this woman just came up to him while he was in the hospital and she's just like, you know, the aliens told me you'd be here. I knew you would come because the aliens were telling me that you'd come and Marshall's just like, yeah. Yeah, that seems about right. So, Marshall and Nettles began to live with each other, and the two of them broke off all contact with their former families, and they started to form a new spiritual belief, and they went all over the western side of America trying to teach it. They didn't have a name for their new belief system, but what they believed is that Jesus had been reincarnated as a Texan. And while they never directly said it, never in the history of their cult have they ever said it, but it is extremely heavily implied that Marshall Applewhite was the reincarnation of Jesus. And that when people die, a spaceship, if they, believe, if they truly believe in what Bonnie and Marshall are preaching, then a spaceship would come and pick up their corpse and they would be revived on the spaceship and they would be taken to heaven. Oh, and in their beliefs, heaven is an actual, like, faraway planet. It's not like another dimension or just like a place in the clouds. It is a literal physical location that is just on another planet. And when they got there, you would be transformed into this immortal being, and it would be the next step in human evolution. In 1975, Applesauce and Nettles converted 50 people at one meeting in California. Marshall and Nettles were trying to convert people in Oregon, and they actually got national news coverage off that, and it was extremely negative and it accused them of brainwashing their converts. Marshall and Nettles were uncomfortable with all this negative attention, so they laid low for a little while and their converts would go across the US to try to convert more people. And this was not in my script, but I did see this once the script was over, and I wanna mention it because it shows that while yes, Marshall and Bonnie were manipulating people, they too themselves truly believed in what they were preaching and what they were doing. To the point, you know, earlier I said that they believed that Marshall was a reincarnation of Jesus, so Marshall was seen as this prophet figure. And they would uh, cherry pick verses out of the Bible, and they'd be like, yeah, that's, uh, that's true, but the, the Jews and the Christians have misinterpreted it, and this is what it really means. And there's some passage in the book of Revelations that talks about an assassination and Marshall freaked out. He's like, oh my goodness, they are going to kill me. They are going to kill me. I am going to die. They are going to assassinate me. And it is during this time that 
you know, he was freaking out about this. But his converts and Bonnie calmed him down, saying, oh, no, it's not a literal interpretation. You know, they're not literally assassinating you. It's an assassination of your character. And he just kind of, he, he's like, I believe you. Anyway, back to the script. So after they had, like, calmed Marshall down, uh, it was now near the end of 1975, and the press just kind of forgot about him, and they weren't so harsh on him. And they gained about 20 followers over that three-year period. So now they had, like, 70. And they started to be really, really strict, making their followers renounce their family, friends, drugs, jewelry, facial hair, and much more. And all of this is strange, but this one just sticks out to me. They required them to legally change their names to be two syllables, and it had to end in O-D-Y. So, so all their followers were named stuff like Rick Odie and Jim Odie. So Marshall Applepie claimed that this would emphasize that their followers were spiritual children. And after they got all that out of the way and, you know, they all shaved their beards and got rid of their jewelry and changed their names, they started to live a nomadic lifestyle, traveling around the western United States and setting up campsites. And Marshall and Nettles stopped doing public meetings and mainly relied on their existing converts to recruit new people. And during this time of inactivity from Bonnie and Marshall, Marshall started to study the Book of Revelations and he started to cherry pick a few verses and he'd be like, look! Aliens, they are real and they want us. And to try and prove all this, Marshall and Bonnie went to Wyoming and they brought like a ton of their followers to watch a UFO visit. They claimed we have contact with the aliens and they're coming to Earth to prove that they exist. And when obviously the aliens did not show up, they're like, oh, why? Man, those aliens, they must have canceled on us and just not, they, they didn't RSVP and they, oh man. Gosh, those guys are so rude. I'm going to send them, you know, I'm going to send them a really strongly worded letter about this. The group would continue their nomadic ways from 1976 to about 1979, where they would bounce around Texas, Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado to try to recruit people. Also, to try and speed up the recruitment process, they broke up into what Marshall would call star clusters, which were just small groups that would spread out among the area to try to cover more ground. And almost immediately after doing this, Marshall started getting scared and paranoid that the clusters would try to branch off and become their own thing. He thought that the clusters were becoming too independent from the original congregation. So he started implementing new rules for the followers, such as no one can get revelations from the alien gods, but Marshall and Bonnie. And the strangest one, in my opinion, were that members were not allowed to be friends with anyone. No one at all. Zero friends whatsoever. The reason for this was Bonnie thought this would lead to insubordination. So with these people not allowed to talk to their previous friends or family, and not being able to make new ones, a lot of them left. This made Marshall even more paranoid, so he stopped recruiting members altogether because he thought that the outside world would corrupt his current members and cause even more of them to leave. Marshall and Bonnie started becoming really big control freaks over their remaining followers, and so they started implementing even more rules, such as they have to ask for advice on every single little thing, and his followers actually didn't seem to mind this, because they saw Marshall as like a father figure, and a really laid back dude, and Marshall would have them do tasks that would make his followers obey him more, and he called them games, and he also manipulated his followers into thinking that everything that they were doing for the cult and for Marshall was actually fun, or that they were doing it by their own choice. And while the cult becoming more strict did scare some more people off, it did make the ones who stayed, it made their bonds a lot closer to Marshall and Bonnie. And so now that Marshall and Bonnie had stopped recruiting and they implemented all these new rules, they only had like 40 followers left. So they decided to settle down and really start thinking and working towards the afterlife of their religion because this is something that they hadn't spent too much time on apparently. And they would rent three houses in Denver but were evicted for not paying rent and moved to Dallas where they rented three more houses. The 40 followers would stay in two of the houses and Marshall and Bonnie would stay into one house by themselves. And once again, Marshall and Bonnie said, oh my goodness, the aliens are coming. They're real. We're going to go see the aliens and they're going to come to our house. I sent them our address. They're coming to us. And so they made their whole group go outside their houses to, to meet the aliens. And they waited all night long. And when once again, the aliens did not come, Marshall was like, uh, well, you see, I knew that the aliens wouldn't come. It was all a lie. And you see, this was all just one big test to see if you were all loyal to me. And, uh, cl clearly you are. So, uh, you can go to sleep now. And that was the end of it. 
In 1980, they let new members into their group again, and the group quickly grew. They got about 80 members and started to relax their strict rules by letting the members get jobs and start contacting their family again. In the mid to early 80s, the philosophy of the cult started to change when Bonnie got diagnosed with cancer, and she would end up dying in 1985. And if you remember earlier, a big thing in their cult was, oh, when you die and you believe our, our religion, then a spaceship will come and pick up your body and take you to the planet heaven. Well, this did not happen for Bonnie. So then Marshall changed it and he's like, oh yeah, no, 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 it's your soul. It's your soul. The spaceship comes and picks up your soul. And no spaceship came. So he's like, yeah, there's a reason for that. And the reason is that if you believe hard enough, if you just are perfect and you believe hard enough then your soul will just rocket itself straight to heaven and everyone just kind of went with it marshall became really sad after bonnie's death and he believed that he was left behind so he could grow the cult's beliefs and guide others to their religion but this depressive state also made marshall go crazy like even more crazy than he already was so a little while after the death of bonnie he did a symbolic ceremony where he would marry all of his followers so Marshall went a little crazy after Bonnie's death, which you could probably tell by him marrying all of his followers, but he also started getting really strict again. And he started to encourage people to stop converting to the religion because he thought that the new converts were actually government agents who were trying to learn more about the cult so they could raid them. And he also started enforcing a hierarchy into the group, and it was structured in such a way that if he died, the whole cult would fall apart. No one could take his place. And it was also a new religious rule that if you wanted the spaceship to pick up your soul, you gotta be friends with Marshall. You gotta be best friends with Marshall if you want the spaceship to take you to the planet heaven. Also, he really started to enforce the idea that Jesus was a reincarnated into a Texan, which once again, while never directly saying it, it was heavily implied that he was said reincarnation. And buckle up, because this next part is really wild. He also started to say that Jesus was an alien who came to earth from the planet heaven and he was killed and rose to the dead and went back to the planet heaven and the real reason that no one followed this spaceship doctrine before is because Jesus found that the humans were unfit to go to heaven but that the aliens were coming back in the 1990s to see if humans were finally ready to go to the planet heaven which obviously one major hole if Jesus is on the planet heaven how is Marshall a reincarnation of Jesus? So as I just pointed out, there's some pretty big holes in this religion. And you may be wondering, how could anyone fall for this? But you also got to understand that Marshall is like a master manipulator. And he would use this strategy where he would uh, tell you a bunch of little lies and get you to believe those. And so the little lies made the big lies seem even, you know, more believable. He would also use that tactic that we talked about earlier, where his initial followers he would not allow to talk with family to talk with any old friends they were only really allowed to communicate with people they were trying to convert or those who were in their cult and by setting up this bubble for so long it just solidified their beliefs because you know if you are around a bunch of people who believe a certain thing over time you yourself become very confident in that belief and by keeping them in this bubble for so long and you know really solidifying these beliefs by the time that they finally did talk to their families again or finally did start trying to convert other people and talk to outsiders it was very difficult for them to be persuaded otherwise but with that being said it wasn't fail proof because there were some who were persuaded otherwise and some did leave the cult and others saw marshall doing these crazy things and some of them still kind of believed the doctrine but decided to you know leave this soon to be sinking ship so in the late 1980s the group started losing members again due to marshall getting bad but the group just kind of stayed under the radar for the most part and they stayed this way up until 1992 where marshall had the great idea to record a 12-part video series which i'm showing footage of right now and they played this footage over satellite tv stations to try and recruit new members and explain their beliefs and ideas and i watched one of them and they're honestly like unsettling to watch uh if you want to watch them you can find them here on youtube you'll have to hunt a bit but you can find them and after the tapes were broadcast over the world it woke a lot of the members up to how crazy these ideas really were and uh they started to leave and with now even more people leaving marshall started to panic and so he spent thirty thousand dollars on advertising for the cult which kind of worked they got a whole new 20 followers what a great investment
Even though they only had like 40 odd members, this gave Marshall the confidence to hit the road for the first time since the 70s, and it worked as they started to pull in more members. And Marshall kind of woke up and realized that if he wanted to keep these new members, he had to stop being so strict. And so he did. And finally, after all this time, after almost a four pages into the script, Marshall finally decides to come up with a name for his group. Yes, you've heard me right. This entire time, since the early 70s up until the early 90s, this group did not have a name. Or if they did, I couldn't find it. But Marshall finally decided to name his group, and he called this group Heaven's Gate. And they made a whole website. And you can still access it today, but please be careful on there. This website does not seem very safe. After the explosion in the numbers, the group decided to relocate to San Diego, California, where a lot of the members would live in this big mansion, and uh, Marshall would be there too. And I didn't mention it earlier, but one of the group's deals was they didn't like sex. I mean, like, they didn't hate it, but it was kind of looked down upon. That was until now. After the move to San Diego, Marshall was like, you know, if you really want to go to heaven, you can't have sex. In fact, you got to get castrated so that you can never have sex again. And immediately, almost all the new members that they just got left. Only the most loyal of loyal followers stayed after Marshall said this. So he only had like 39 followers left. Sure enough, they all got castrated, and they all moved into a big mansion in Santa Fe, California. And it's here that Marshall heard that the hale Bop comet was going to fly past the Earth. And Marshall said that this was it. The aliens are here. That comet is a spaceship. And that comet's coming to check up on us, and it's going to pick us up and take us to heaven. So in 1997, the group prepared to board the ship and wrote or recorded their final messages before getting ready to board the spaceship. But how are they going to get on the ship? Well, if you remember from earlier, they believed that their souls were going to be picked up by the ship. So in order to board the ship, they had to kill themselves. So I'm now going to talk about how they did it, and I understand some people may not want to hear that. So if you don't, uh, go to this time that I've put on screen. The way that they decided to do it was by eating poisoned applesauce or pudding. And then they would wash it down with alcohol, and just to make sure that they died, they would wrap a plastic bag around their head. So if the poison didn't kill them, they would suffocate to death. And they did it in waves. Like a, a group of eight of them would do it, and then they would be dressed in Nike suits and Nike uh, shoes, and then another group would do it, and so on and so forth, until Marshall was the last one left. There were only two survivors of this mass suicide that took place at this mansion, and those two survivors were left behind to keep the website running. After the mass suicide, that was the end of the Heaven's Gate cult. Uh, a lot of the people who had left earlier kind of, you know, discredited their beliefs once the mass suicide took place. And uh, those two people, uh, I can't find out who they are, but they're still alive because the website is still up and running. And so ends the story of Marshall Applewhite and the Heaven's Gate cult. Thank you all for watching and thank you Monkey Man for suggesting this topic. And if you have a topic you want to see, put it in the comments below and I'll shout you out if I pick it. Anyway, please like, share, and subscribe, and goodbye.